Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. And be sure to hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever I have a new video. Hope you enjoy this. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken here uh, with us uh, for another full hour of Ask Me Anything. And since about a minute before the show started, the lines have just been full. Lots and lots of questions for uh, Jimmy today. Uh, you're welcome to give it a shot as the show goes on, 888-318-7884. Whether you're Catholic or not, uh, if you've got a question for Jimmy, uh, feel welcome here. We'd love to talk with you, 888-318-7884. Jimmy is senior apologist here at Catholic Answers, the author of A Daily Defense, 365 Days Plus One to Becoming a Better Apologist, and many other things as as well as, as we always like to say, the proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Thank you for coming back for another hour, Jimmy Aiken. You're welcome, Cyril Kellett. And uh, some controversy about your hat in the first hour when you went back to wearing it. I actually had forgotten there that, that there was... wasn't a, any controversy. Uh, but, it was, uh, uh, I thought it was very heated. I you, thought it got You have very, a rich inner life. <laughs> well... Uh, Anyway, eight 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 three one eight seven eight eight four is number one. Why does Zach thinks that's hilarious that you said I have a rich inner life? He can't get over that. Yeah. That's, it's not the. Uh, all right, I'm gonna just go to the calls. Never been ganging up on me, Chris in Connecticut, uh, listening on the Catholic Answers Live. No, uh, yeah, okay, Chris, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I got. Am I supposed to go to Chris or not? I, I'm, I'm confused by the. Chris, are you we there? Did, we did Chris on line one. We're next up scheduled to go to Jamie on line six. Okay, let's do that. Jamie on line six in Boston, Massachusetts. Oh, our old friend Jamie in Boston. Nice to talk with you again, Jamie. You too. It's been a minute. How are we doing? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well. Actually, <laughs> not that good. Wonderful. The last few minutes have been a wreck for me, but uh, go, <laughs> go ahead, Jamie, with your question for Jimmy. I have a question about communion uh, you know, between or with people of different denominations. Even among Protestants, it seems like Protestants don't feel comfortable always taking communion together. Um, I guess I'm just wondering exactly why, you know, if we believe different things about it, why is that so important? Why couldn't we just believe our different things and still eat it together? Okay, well, um, one of the things you find is there's actually a spectrum of opinion um, among among Christians of different communities on this subject. Um, there are, for example, uh, various Protestant groups who practice what's known as open communion, and they will they will invite anybody who wants to come to the really open ones will invite anybody who wants to come take communion from them to receive communion from them. Um, however, actually not all open communion people are fully open. They may insist that you share their belief about the Eucharist. For example, the versions of Protestantism that tend to practice open communion tend to have a symbolic view of the of the Eucharistic elements. So they don't think Jesus is really present in the elements. They think this is just a symbol of Jesus' body and this is just a symbol of Jesus' blood. And so they consequently don't take protecting Jesus from being profaned here as seriously, because they don't think Jesus is there. But even they frequently will um, will impose restrictions. Even though they say we practice open communion, they'll say things like, anyone who believes, you know, in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, which is an evangelical articulation of the Christian faith, is welcome to receive communion. But if you're not an evangelical, you're not you're not you're not you're not actually invited or they may say you know if you think that Jesus is really present in the elements you're committing idolatry and we don't want idolaters receiving our communion so even they frequently will will even though they may use the language of open communion oftentimes they're not really fully open other christians who have a belief in the real presence tend to be more restrictive 
about who they allow to receive communion. And th- that's not just Catholics, that's other groups, Christians too. And there's a good reason for that. If you look in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul talks about how the Corinthians were receiving communion in situations where they shouldn't. And he says that because they were doing this, many of you are weak and sick, and some have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism for some of you have died because you were receiving communion when you shouldn't. And so there are dangers to the recipient if they're receiving communion when they shouldn't. If they're if they're not spiritually prepared to receive, then they shouldn't be receiving, and they may, in Paul's view, incur divine judgment for that. And so there's a need to protect people who who a there's a recognition there not everyone should be receiving communion and secondarily there's a need to protect the people who aren't who aren't qualified to receive communion at least at the moment then there's one of the specific things that saint paul says in first corinthians is if you um if you receive without discerning the body and blood of the lord you're receiving in an unworthy manner and are liable to divine judgment. So you need to, according to St. Paul, discern that this really is the body and blood of Christ. And that means you need to believe in the real presence. Um, So, you know, as a result, uh, Christians who do take a real presence view tend to recognize that and how important it is and say, I'm sorry if you think this is just a symbol. We can't offer you communion because St. Paul indicates you'd, you'd be receiving it and incurring judgment to yourself. Um, also, you want to, because Jesus is there and he is infinitely holy, you want to protect him from being, um, from being profaned by someone receiving him without recognizing it. Because we need to recognize Jesus when he's there. Um, what profanation is, I should probably explain that, is the opposite of treating something as sacred. Jesus is sacred, and to honor him by treating him as if he's really here, that's a good thing. What profanation does is it takes something that's sacred and treats it as if it's not sacred. And so if Jesus is really there, and you're pretending he, you're not recognizing the fact that he's really there, then you're treating something that is sacred, namely Jesus, as if it's not sacred. And so you're profaning Jesus by doing that. And the churches have an obligation to not profane Jesus and to not encourage people to profane Jesus. So uh, that's another factor that applies here. Um, There's more I could say about all this, but how's that as a first-pass answer to your question, or would you like to ask a follow-up? Oh, no, that makes a lot of sense. I'll let the next caller go. I know you've got a full docket. Thanks so much for your help. No thank, problem. Thank you, Jamie. It's always nice to talk with you. Um, I, we do have a, another caller lined up. It's Grace Ann in Iowa. And Grace Ann, are you there with us? Hello. I was wondering if all angels are boys and girls like humans. Are all angels boys and girls like humans? Well, um, the answer would appear to be no. Now, this isn't something that the Church has a teaching on, but what the Church teaches is that angels are created spirits that do not natively have bodies, and consequently, um, it would seem that they don't have sexes. It's not like they're really male or really female. They may present themselves to us as if they're a male angel or a female angel, because we're used to meeting people who are male or female. And so they could make us more comfortable by appearing to us as a male or a female, but it doesn't appear because they don't reproduce. Um, You know, Jesus says that in the resurrection, we're going to be like the angels of heaven and not get married. Well, okay, we'll still have our genders because we're going to have our bodies, so we, we will still be male or female. We just won't be reproducing. But the angels were designed to be immortal and not need to reproduce. So it doesn't seem like they would have any reason to have, both because they don't have a physical body and because they're immortal, it would seem they don't have a reason to have sex, to either be a boy or a girl. And 
So I would say they may assume an appearance of being a boy or a girl, but in reality, in their own nature, I would say that they it doesn't look like they would really be a boy or a girl. Now, does that uh, get at what you wanted us to answer, Grace Ann? Yeah. Well, Grace Ann, uh, you did a really good job on the phone. Your parents must be very proud of you. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear that they are. Uh, I hope you will call again. Uh, Jimmy, we're going to say something more. Oh, this is just a a fun fact follow-up. Even though it appears that angels don't actually have gender, um, not everyone in history has shared that view. The author of the Book of Jubilees, which was a book written about 150 years before Christ, thought that angels did have gender. And he seems to have thought they were male, at least all the ones he mentions are male. And he says that the two highest kinds of angels were created circumcised, whereas the lower five kinds of angels were created uncircumcised. So it's like you got Jewish circumcised angels and Gentile uncircumcised angels. But... um, but that's not in the Bible, so don't put any don't put any trust in that. Uh, Grace Ann, uh, once again, thank you so much uh, for the call. You are a delightful person, and maybe you'll call again with another question. But we have to take our break. We will be right back with more. Ask me anything with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Let us help you with your question today on Catholic Answers Live. Do you have a question but prefer to ask it privately? Catholic Questions can help. Go to CatholicQuestions.com to ask your question online, email us, drop us a letter, or give us a call. Longtime Catholic Answers Live apologist and author Jim Blackburn or another Catholic Questions apologist will be happy to assist you. Catholic Questions proudly supports Catholic Answers Live, so visit us at CatholicQuestions.com today. That's CatholicQuestions.com. Another great podcast on EWTN Podcast Central is On the Journey. Matt, Ken, and Kenny are three former Protestants who share the ideas and experiences that led them to the Catholic Church. You can hear this and other faith-filled podcasts from our friends and affiliates around the world, all in one place, all free at EWTN Podcast Central. Visit EWTN.com slash radio and click on Podcast Central today. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Big conference coming up just a month from today. We'll be at the big Catholic Answers uh, conference. We're going to do the radio program live from there. And uh, if you've got a question, bring it with you. We'll try to get you live on the air. Edgar, are you going to do, be doing call, not call screening, but question screening at the, so you can just Line up with Edgar and ask your question if you come, September 26th through 29th. Learn from me the parables, sermons, and conversations of Jesus Christ. That's uh, what the topic. That's the topic we'll be covering. And you can find out all about who will be there and how to get there and all that at CatholicAnswersConference.com. CatholicAnswersConference.com. Going to Lincoln, Nebraska now. And if you're in Lincoln, like Brendan, you're probably listening on Spirit Catholic Radio. Brendan, welcome. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. I just finished your book, The Bible is a Catholic Book. It's mm-hmm. wonderfully written, and I think it does a good job at dispelling Protestant myths. I have Thank an you. interesting question about the book, though. Mm-hmm. You described Mark as Peter's interpreter. Since Peter was in the upper room at Pentecost, where he received the gift of tongues, why did Peter need an interpreter? Okay, so let's start uh in with where with how we with why we believe mark was peter's interpreter um this is derived from among other sources a quotation from an eyewitness of jesus's ministry named john the elder or john the presbyter and he's thought by some to be the author of some or all of the joanine or john related literature in the new testament but he definitely was an eyewitness of Jesus's ministry in the first century. And according to him, Mark wrote his gospel because he was Peter's interpreter and remembered Peter's preaching and basically consigned it to writing. So that's where the claim is first documented, that Mark was Peter's interpreter. The word that that is used in Greek there is hermeneutes, 
hermeneutes can mean more than one thing. It can mean translator, and that's the sense that applies to your question. If Peter received the gift of tongues on Pentecost, why would he then need an interpreter, a translator? Well, um, the answer I would propose to that is because tongues is an intermittent gift. Uh, just c- you can, it, when God gave him the ability to speak in tongues, It wasn't something they did all the time. They did it on Pentecost. They may have done it on other occasions. But but it also didn't mean that the tongue speaker knew what he was saying. And we can show that from St. Paul's discussion of tongues in 1 Corinthians, because he says that you shouldn't uh, have people speaking in tongues in the liturgy unless you've also got someone who has the gift of the interpretation of tongues. Well, the only reason you'd need a second person with the gift of interpretation is if the first person who's doing the speaking in tongues doesn't know what he's saying. So under God's, under the action of God's Spirit, he's speaking in another language and declaring God's glory and stuff like that, but he doesn't know what's coming out of his own mouth. And so for Peter to effectively preach to uh, to groups of people around the Roman world, he would need to be able to consciously, to make sure I'm saying what I need to say to these people, he'd need to consciously understand what he's saying. And that's what not what's happening in the gift of tongues considered by itself. Now, one person might have both the ability to speak and interpret in tongues, but ordinarily you have one or the other, but not both. And so Peter ordinarily in his ministry relied on his own natural language or knowledge of languages to talk to people. Um, he would have certainly had Aramaic, but and Aramaic was common in the East, especially in the centuries before Christ. It was kind of an international language that different different nations used, but it wasn't that common in Rome. Peter also might have had some Hebrew, but that's not common in Rome either. And Peter might have had some Greek, because Greek was the current major international language around the Roman world, and Peter even wrote in Greek, although he could have had help from uh, a translator there. In any event, Peter, for ordinary purposes, relied on his natural knowledge of languages to communicate with people around the Roman world and didn't simply speak in tongues. That was something that may have happened on occasion, like on Pentecost, but it was the exception rather than the rule. So that's how to explain why Peter would need a translator if uh, we interpret hermeneutes as translator. But the term also has other meanings. Like if you read, uh, including in English, um, if you if you an interpreter can be more than just a translator. An interpreter also can be a commentator. And so we read about biblical interpreters. And uh, what a biblical interpreter does is not translate Scripture. That would make them a Bible translator. But what they what they do is they interpret the meaning of statements in Scripture for other people. And hermeneutes can either mean translator in the sense of changing one language into another, or it can mean an interpreter in the sense of a guide to help you understand somebody's thought. And so what John the Elder may be saying is that Mark was Peter's translator, or that he was a companion who helped people understand Peter's thought. Look, Kind of like, you know, Timothy was uh, a companion of Paul who would also preach alongside Paul and help people understand Paul's thought. Well, the same thing could have been true of Mark and Peter. Uh, But in that case, the question of speaking in tongues doesn't arise at all if he's that kind of an interpreter who interprets the thought of of Peter rather than the language of Peter. So, uh, So that's what I have to say to that. Uh, Brendan, uh, I hope that was helpful to you. Again, all the lines are full, so I'm going to keep going. But thank you very much for the call and for the question. Going to Long Island, New York, our old friend Gil in Long Island. Welcome back, Gil. From excellence in skilled nursing well, care. To- eh, we're going to come back to you, Gil. Well, uh, hang on. We, we will. I won't uh, let your call go, Gil. We'll come back to you. But um, John's in Oklahoma listening to EWTN on Channel 130, Sirius XM Satellite Radio. John, welcome to you. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. 
Yeah, how you doing, guys? Um, I was going through YouTube. I came across uh, Deacon Burke. And, okay. you know, this is this guy, I mean, if you guys, if the Protestants or the ex-Protestants miss that old fire and brimstone, absolutely the guy to go watch. He is, he's an awesome guy to watch. He is. But I came up, he, he was talking about how a husband can lust after his, after his husband, or wife, I'm sorry, a husband can lust after his wife, but the Bible also says that the bedroom is undefiled. And I was wondering if Jimmy could elaborate a little bit on that to make it more understandable, because I don't know if it was just me that day or what, but I just I, I couldn't grasp the concept that a husband can lust after his wife and it be sinful. All right, John, thank you. Okay, so I didn't see whatever Deacon, or hear whatever Deacon Burke said, and when I don't know what someone said, I can never comment on it directly, because there may be something that got, you know, left out or changed in the transmission, and so I can't comment on what he said. What I can do is answer the question, um, is it possible for a husband to lust after his wife in a way that is sinful? And the answer is yes. Now, have it, it, it it's partly going to depend on how you define lust lust can be understood as simply sexual desire and there's no problem having sexual desire for your wife in fact that's the norm um in in under normal circumstances that's a good thing on the other hand you could define lust as improper sexual desire or excessive sexual desire and it's possible that a, a, a husband could have improper sexual desire for his wife. You know, he might want to do sexual acts that are not moral with his wife. Or he might have excessive desire for his wife that causes problems. But it's not a sin simply because your desire is disordered or excessive in some way. Where it would become a sin is when it becomes a voluntary act, because all sins are voluntary acts. If it's not a voluntary act, it's not a sin. It may be a temptation, but temptation and sin are two different things. So I would say a disordered sexual desire for one's wife or excessive Desire, sexual desire for one's wife, I would say that those are temptations, but they don't become sins until there's a voluntary act. And so the voluntary act would be something like a free choice to indulge in, uh, in some form of sexual desire for one's wife when it's not appropriate. For example, um, let's suppose <clears throat> that you and your wife are using natural family planning because right now is not the right time to have a baby. So, and you happen to be in those days each month where you shouldn't be having relations. Okay, well, the thing to do in that situation is not encourage sexual desire during those days. You may have it, but don't voluntarily encourage it because that's going to lead to potential problems like... Um, you could start fantasizing about your wife and stirring up sexual desire, and that could tempt you to pressure her into having sex when the two of you have made an agreement not to for the, on this day, or it could tempt you to commit some other kind of sexual activity without your wife. Or it could tempt you to do something with your wife that's not going to be open to procreation. Or, you know, there are a whole bunch of different ways this can go wrong. So you shouldn't be voluntarily stirring up this desire in a situation when it's inappropriate. On the other hand, if it's not a day where the two of you have agreed not to have sex and you're both consenting and preparing to have sex, well, then absolutely stir up the desire then. That's part of what helps you have the relations. But um, there are circumstances where it's not appropriate to have relations, and therefore there are circumstances where it's not appropriate to deliberately, voluntarily stir up the desire. John, all that makes sense to you? Yeah, um, yeah, a little bit. Um, now, maybe can can you kind of elaborate a little bit on what it, what the Bible means by the bedroom is undefiled? It means no one is to do anything in the bedroom that they shouldn't. 
So don't sleep with someone else. You know, Paul said this is in, I'd have to check and see if it's in the optative mood or what the exact um, mood is in Greek. But it's basically, it's commonly translated, let the bedroom be undefiled, meaning everybody keep your your sexual relations with your spouse pure and holy don't 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 do improper stuff or or sleep with people other than your spouse or stuff like that uh john uh, thanks very much uh, for the question jimmy aiken is our guest it's ask me anything and shocking there's one line open we haven't had lines open all day if you want to uh, grab that line and ask your question you're very welcome here 888-3187-884 uh, Jimmy's very indulgent in whatever uh, question you might have. Uh, he's very likely to take it, so go. just don't ask about sports ball. 888-3187-884 is the number. Ask me anything. We'll continue right after this on Catholic Answers Live. When the resurrected Jesus appeared to disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until the breaking of the bread. The same is true today. In the Holy Eucharist, we really meet Jesus. In The Eucharist is Really Jesus, author Joe Heschmeyer explains how knowing Jesus in the Eucharist is the key to understanding all of Christian faith. Order your copy of The Eucharist is Really Jesus today at shop.catholic.com or get it at a good Catholic bookstore. Our Lord needs articulate defenders of the truth to spread the joy of the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Monthly Giving Club, Society 315, helps you fulfill the call in 1 Peter 315 to always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you. For as little as $10 a month, you'll help Catholics grow in faith, bring lapsed Catholics home, and lead non-Catholics to the truth. Go to casociety315.com and join today. As we read the Gospels, every Christian faces the question again and again, what does Jesus mean? Getting the answer right is critical to both growth in holiness and fruitful evangelization. Want to know Jesus better so you can introduce him to your friends? Then it's time to get serious about understanding his words. Why not join Catholic Answers for our 10th annual Apologetics Conference? Learn from me the parables, sermons, and conversations of Jesus Christ. September 26th through 29th, right here in sunny San Diego. Learn from our guests, Dr. Scott Hahn and Kimberly Hahn, Dr. Ray Garendi, Father Sebastian Walsh, Billy Junker, Father Paul Check, and of course, all of your favorite Catholic Answers apologists. It'll be four days of fun, faith, fellowship, and a live radio show. Seats are still available, but going fast to visit catholicanswersconference.com or call one 888 291 8000 today. Groovy music coming at you from Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken, our guest, Thursday afternoon here in Southern California, and your calls are welcome. 888 318 784. We had a connection problem with Gil in Long Island before, but uh, he is back, and that's good news. Welcome back, Gil. Welcome. Can you hear me good? Very well, yes. Oh, praise God. Um, Jesus is the rock, and I'm ready to roll since you play that little rock and roll music there in the background. <laughs> I love it. All right, Gil. And, and I, I love the way you treat me all these years calling the program. You don't know how much it means to me. I feel like I'm appreciated and cherished by you in the Lord. I really thank you for your kindness towards huh. me and towards even non-Catholic callers as well. I really love it. It's hard with the non-Catholic callers, Gil, but uh, thank you for those. Very, I'm just kidding. It's, thank you for the. It means a lot to me that you would say, take the time to say that. Thank you. Well, I hope you don't mind me sending you an electronic hug from the sheep. I was, the, anyway. I was expecting it. Praise God. Okay. I have a question because I, I, I told you last year I'm having trouble with my eyes. I'm having like an infection in my eye. I might get surgery mm-hmm. next week and... Um, uh, it's really, really uncomfortable. Uh, you can't imagine. It's a horror. But Psalm um, uh, 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack nothing. 
in light of what I'm going through, how can I apply that to my tribulation or my trial? Because it's so uncomfortable and it's hard to believe in God when you're going through that. Well, so these... So let's go back over the two verses again in the translation you're using. So what was the quotation from Psalm 34 you said? The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Yeah, and then the passage from Psalm 23? Yeah, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack nothing. So another translation. Okay, so, um, so well, both of these are encouragements to people who are undergoing a trial of some kind. Um, you know, so I would say, well, you know, um, you're undergoing a trial right now. It happens to be a medical issue, and it's causing you discomfort at the moment. So, you know, that's um, something that is bad, but these verses give you assurance that God cares about you in this situation and will help you get through the situation. Now, that may or may not mean a particular outcome, because God doesn't guarantee particular outcomes. But he will, one way or another, uh, ultimately help you get past this, either in this life or in the next life. But I would suspect, given the advances he's allowed medical technology to to have, you know, hopefully if you have your surgery next week, it'll take care of the problem and you'll heal quickly and it won't be a problem anymore. But one way or another, you can rely on God. And so just, uh, you know, pray to him. We'll encourage other people to pray for you and for everyone in a similar situation. And uh, and trust God and leave it in his, his hands and don't fret about it too much. Uh, Gil, uh, thank you very much. I'm very sorry about your uh, eyes. I know that's been a, bo- a, a problem for a long time. Um, we will certainly pray for you here. Um, we pray after the show, so we will remember uh, your eyes and our intention after the show. And, and uh, I hope we'll g- get to speak many more times uh, before too long. God bless you as you prepare for that surgery. Uh, I will go on now, uh, because every line full still, George in Philly. Pennsylvania, listening on the Catholic Answers Live app. Welcome, George. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Hello, Cy. Hello, Jimmy. Thank you for having me. My question is about uh, what am I allowed to do, whether in prayer or worship, with non-Catholic Christians? I know there's talk about like a passive communion, but I'm not sure what that actually looks like. Uh, thank you. Okay, well, in terms of prayer, you can do anything as long as you don't articulate something that or affirm something that's contrary to the Catholic understanding of the faith. So if you want to say the Lord's Prayer with, say, non-Catholic Christians, that's totally fine. Their, their translation may be a little different, but, you know, it's still the same fundamental prayer. And you could use their words, because their translation of it is just a different translation, but it's the same prayer. Um On the other hand, if they're praying, oh, Lord, thank you for opening our eyes to the fact that there is no pope and you're you're not really present in the body and in the in the elements of the Lord's Supper, that they're just symbols and nothing more. Well, then you shouldn't be affirming that you don't say amen to that. But as long as it's as long as what they're saying is consistent with the Catholic faith, there's no problem agreeing with it. Um, in terms of worship, the same thing is broadly true of of worship. You, now you can sit and listen to anything that's going on in a in a Protestant service. You need to fulfill your own Sunday obligation. But in addition to that, you know you, you can attend a service and be a passive observer. The issue becomes when you become active. Now, let's, like, for example, singing a hymn. That requires you to take action. Well, as long as the the same rules that apply to prayer apply to, apply to singing. So if the if the hymn doesn't, doesn't say anything contrary to the Catholic faith, you, you can sing it. Uh, what about saying amen to whatever the preacher says? Well, as long as he didn't say, you know, because that's a custom in some churches for people from the pews to say amen. Well, if he what he just said is correct, if it's not contrary to the Catholic faith, then you can say amen. Um, you can participate in the local customs. You know, if they raise their hands when they pray, you can raise your hands as you pray. Not a big deal. The catching point, at least in terms of ordinary services, is going to be the sacraments. 
because um, in non-Catholic churches, depending on the church, the sacraments may not be valid. Typically, in a Protestant church, because Protestantism did not retain the priesthood, they're not going to have valid sacraments. Um, on the other hand, in an Eastern Orthodox church, they did retain the priesthood, and so their sacraments are valid. And the Catholic Church doesn't have a problem if it's to your spiritual advantage, with um, you know if and if you know a Catholic minister is not available for you to receive the sacraments in an Eastern Orthodox Church. You also need to respect their rights, though they may not want to give them to you since you're not Orthodox. In a Protestant Church, though, the situation is different because their sacraments are not typically valid. You don't want to be receiving the sacraments there. The canon law would prohibit that. There are a few other stipulations, like if you want to get married or become a godparent or something like that, but those are the basic rules that would apply to prayer and worship in general. Okay, George? Great. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, let's go to Andrew in uh, St. Henry, Ohio. Andrew, I think you've been waiting a long time. Thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question for Jimmy. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Jimmy, I recently came across uh, numerous blog, uh, blog articles from you uh, mm -hmm. making the claim that some magisterial teachings can fall into desuetude, if I'm pronouncing that mm -hmm. right, or disuetude. Yeah, desuetude. I was wondering if you could back up that claim and maybe provide an example of that. Sure. I'm surprised you said you found numerous blog posts by me from the, on this. I don't know that I've written numerous ones, although I'm sure I've mentioned it from time to time. Uh, for people who may not be familiar, desuetude is a term of art in law. So it's used, for example, in canon law. And what it means is something has, has fallen into disuse. This no longer applies today. And um, that is something I talk about at some, not extensive length, but I cover it at you know some greater length than I probably can at the moment in my book, Teaching with Authority. So, Cy, uh, let's get ready to send Andrew a copy of Teaching with Authority so he can read reads what I have he can read what I have to say about it. In terms of the basics, though, the Church divides its teachings into two kinds, two fundamental kinds, either, either infallible or non-infallible. Infallible teachings have been guaranteed to be true, so they never, under any circumstances, lose their authority. But what about non-infallible teachings. Well, the Church holds, and this, this is something that was articulated partly by the Second Vatican Council, but more fully by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith after the Council, non-infallible teachings are to have their authority judged by several criteria, including the forcefulness of the language that's used to articulate them, the nature of the document that they appear in, and the frequency with which the magisterium repeats the teaching. So if you see a, a doctrine being repeated more and more frequently, th then you assign it a higher value and a higher level of authority, even though it's not infallible. But, but what happens if you see the reverse? If a document, if a doctrine has been declining in how frequently the magisterium repeats it, that would be a sign that the magisterium is investing it with less value. And so what if you've got a non-infallible teaching that hadn't been repeated in centuries? You know, like maybe, maybe a pope said something in the 400s, but he didn't make it infallible, and nobody's mentioned it in the last uh, in a magisterial document in the last 16 centuries. Well, this looks like it's fallen into disuse. It's it it since it hadn't been repeated at all in this lengthy period of time. It looks like the magisterium has dropped this, and so it's fallen into disuse or desuetude, and would no longer be authoritative. That's why you can't just reach back infinitely far into the past and grab something and claim it still applies today. And to give you an example of this, tonsure. Um, if you read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, or I'm sorry, the, the, the Roman Catechism, sometimes called the Catechism of Trent, when it talks about tonsure, 
it says that the church teaches that this is of apostolic institution, meaning the apostles were getting tonsures. But um, subsequent historical research indicated that was not the case, that tonsure was introduced later in certain Christian circles. It did not actually date back to the time of the apostles. And the magisterium never came out and issued a retraction on that. What tends to happen when a teaching falls into desuetude is the church doesn't issue a retraction. Instead, they simply allow contrary opinions to be expressed. And we see an example of that in the 1906-ish edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia, where if you read the article on tonsure in that, and this has an imprimatur, it says that it was introduced later. It wasn't of apost- of, it doesn't actually go all the way back to the apostles. And so the issue of the apostolic origin of tonsure would be an example of a non-infallible teaching that never really had a super high level of authority that then fell into desuetude and was quietly retired. And the magisterium in imprimatur documents that are, by their nature, they're not meant to contradict church teaching, other people could express other opinions. So that would be a, a rationale for why it happens, and uh, and also an example. Uh, Andrew, hang on. Uh, we'd love to send you the, a copy of the book, uh, Teaching with Authority. Just give us an address, and we'll send it out to you. We'll be right back with more questions for Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Hang on. Catholic Answers Live will return in a moment. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. One of the biggest mistakes a Christian can make is to try to do good without God's help. St. Therese said, when we trust only ourselves and not God, our soul becomes incapable of virtue. Her remedy? Works of charity. And the greatest work of charity is to share the gospel. At St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, we encourage you to share the gospel with someone who doesn't know Jesus. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. StreetEvangelization.com EWTN, communicating the faith. Thanks for all that you do. I've learned so much from you. I appreciate what you guys do. And I have to say, this is the first time I call. I just love listening to EWTN. And uh, you're part of that great team out there. It just blesses me so much. Thanks so much for taking my call. I listen to this every day. And you guys are great. So I thank you for that. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. We've been plowing through questions with Jimmy Aiken, lots of questions, uh, and uh, lots more to go, despite that we are in our last segment. It's Ask Me Anything. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. And now we go to Joey in Gregory, Michigan, listening to EWTN on Channel 130, Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Gregory, thank you for the call. Go ahead with the question. Hi, this is Joey. How you doing? Oh, I, I said Gregory. Yeah, you're Joey in Greg in the town of Gregory. I apologize, <laughs> Joey. Uh, go ahead with your question. That's okay. Jimmy, I just wanted to say you guys are absolutely wonderful to listen to for years. So, um, oh, thank you. My wife and I have seven. You're welcome. Our, my wife and I have seven children, and uh-huh. um, we homeschool. Uh-huh, and our cool. last two pregnancies um, uh, ended up in... Um, um, her having a miscarriage. The last miscarriage, mm. she uh, bled to the point to where um, she uh, almost died. So, mm. um, well, praise she, God she uh, did. So, yeah, praise God. She's a great mother. I, I don't deserve her. But um, uh, the question would be um, she really got, uh, we got into natural family planning. Um, so, um, uh, this wouldn't happen to her again. We're we're older now. I'm 52. She's 48, mm-hmm. and um, she's really scared that this will happen to her again if she gets pregnant. So we've been mm-hmm. continuing the natural family planning um, ever since. And mm-hmm. I don't know if it's 
uh, inappropriate just to keep on doing it because she's she keeps on doing it no matter what because of the fact that she doesn't want to go through that again. Mm-hmm. And we're still young enough to where we had, I mean, we had, we're both very healthy adults. And I don't know if it's inappropriate uh, for us to keep uh, on doing the natural family planning because of that reason. Um, I think she's going through menopause now to where it's less likely that she would get pregnant because she mm-hmm. still wants to keep doing the natural family planning. Uh, that's the first part of my question, and I have a real fast one after you answer this one, if I have time with you. Okay. Well, um, so the church... Now, you, okay, if you go out and you just read websites or documents from certain groups, they're going to say, some of them are going to say things like, you need a grave reason to use NFP to avoid having children. Um, that is not what humanity Vitae says, Humanae Vitae being the 1968 document where Pope Paul VI laid out church teaching on this matter. Um, That is simply not what the document says. It says that one can use natural family planning for a just cause. It uses the Latin word justus. So for a just cause, you can use natural family planning. And in Catholic uh, church speak, just cause is a term of art that basically means any reason that is not illegal. So this is a very low threshold. And um, and if your wife almost died because she was bleeding during a miscarriage, okay, that's definitely a just cause. And if, if it gives her peace of mind and helps strengthen your marriage to uh, continue using natural family planning, then, then you've got a just cause to do it. I would say if someone almost dies, and and this could likely replicate in the future, that's a grave cause. So I would say whether you use just cause analysis, which is what the document actually says, or even if you use grave cause analysis, um, either way, you're covered. And so I would say you're not doing anything inappropriate by using natural family planning in this kind of situation. And it probably won't be, given that your wife may be either entering menopause or or w- will soon go through menopause, it, it may not be uh, a, an issue for too much longer. If on the other side of menopause, you know, y'all want to reconsider and say, okay, now that now that menopause has happened, we don't need to worry about this. Well, um, then that would be great. On the other hand, if she just wants to maintain the the NFP as a safeguard in case there was a breakthrough ovulation despite the menopause, just so just for her own peace of mind, then I would try to be understanding of that. And it's just a it's just a few days a month, and so I would try to be understanding of that as an act as a sign of love and respect for her. Now, now Joey, uh, first of all, uh, I want to know if that was uh, helpful to you. I got at what you needed and uh, what the, your uh, short follow up was. Yeah, a thousand percent. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, that's what I thought it was, but I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Uh, the second one was really quick. Um, are there positions in sexual activity between um, husband and wife, even though the sperm goes to the ovum and it, uh, during the, uh, that sexual act, is, is, can sexual uh, acts in different positions be inappropriate? Um, okay, so uh, as the, the standard... Uh understanding among Catholic moral theologians is as long as the sexual act involves the deposition of the male germ cells vaginally, the act is okay. Beyond that, um, it doesn't matter what postures your bodies are in, um, as long as vaginal deposition of the male germ cells happens, um, the act is fulfilling its function of uh, of being open to procreation, and beyond that, it's up to you how you accomplish that. Joey, thanks. I'm going to go because we, we have a few more calls and only a few more minutes, so, but thank you very much for the call and the questions. Uh, Ryan is right here in San Diego uh, watching on Twitch. Ryan, uh, go ahead with your question for Jimmy. Um, hi, Mr. Agins. Um mm-hmm. 
first, I just want to say thank you for everything you have done. Um, I used to be an atheist, and reading a lot of your stuff has really helped me out of that. So I just want to thank you for that, firstly. Um, secondly, so I go to a Byzantine Catholic church and also a Chaldean mm-hmm. church, and mm-hmm. I've been recently looking into uh, the Eastern Catholicism and just how much more diverse um, the Eastern churches are when compared to the Western churches, there seems to be not as much diversity in the rites and whatnot. And I just want to ask you, um, why is that the case? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you're ref- referring to. Um, the uh, it, it, but I suspect it may be due to uh, selection bias in what you're in what you're looking at. Um, there are more than twenty. Uh, Catholic churches that are all in communion with the Pope, and they fall into uh, like five major liturgical traditions, one of which is Byzantine, but also, you know, Chaldean is another, Maronite is another, Um, although actually I need to go and check which actual liturgical traditions those all belong to. Having said that, um, you're going to see diversity between all of the different churches, but and if you if you pick two, like Byzantine and Chaldean, you're going to note differences in them. And if you then use as a comparison the the Latin Church, it's going to appear that the Latin Church has less diversity. But that's that's because you're looking at one thing on that side of the equation, and you're looking at two things on the other side of the equation. If you flip that and say compared the uh, the Latin rite and the Byzantine rite to each other, you'd say, oh, there's differences between them. And if you then compared that on the other side of the equation to the Chaldean church, it would look like the Chaldean church didn't have much diversity compared to the diversity between that you can see between the Latin church and the Byzantine church. And the same would happen with any combination of these things. If you compare, if you single out one church, it's going to have less perceived diversity than if than than the other churches are going to have. So it it may be because of how you're framing the question, and considering the Latin Church on its own as opposed to putting it in the framework of this larger group of churches. Now, even within the Latin Church, there are differences. Uh, we, earlier today, we were talking about the the Ambrosian Rite, which is used in Milan. We were talking about the Dominican usage and the Anglican usage and things like that. So there is there, there's also the 1962 usage. So there is diversity within the Roman uh, Church, within the Western Church, but it may be masked if you're if you're just looking at, if you're comparing other bodies that have very different histories and singling out the Latin church by itself uh, on one side of the equation. I don't know if that helps. That's me trying to articulate it off the top of my head. You tell me, did I answer what you needed? Um, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a really good answer. Um, mm-hmm. So then what I would ask, how would you say I should go about looking at the different, or looking at the Latin Rite um, of churches and the Eastern Rite mm-hmm. churches? Well, I'd just say study them all and appreciate them all. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about how diverse or not diverse they are. They're all legitimate expressions of uh, the diversity that God willed his church to have, and rather than fretting about, well, how much diversity is there, just learn the different options. Learn the different diversity that is built into these different churches and appreciate them. Every spirituality has, has things to contribute. So I, I would say study them all and all their variants and just appreciate what God has led the church to, to have going on in these different communities. Ryan, thanks. Uh, you can hear the music. That means we have come to the end, but thank you for the question. Thanks to everybody who called, uh, all one million people who got their questions answered by Jimmy. Uh, I might be off by one or two, but I'm pretty close to one million today, Jimmy. Congratulations. 
Thank you. And uh, tomorrow on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, uh, did you say weird questions? Is that that's it, right? Weird yep. questions. Weird tomorrow. questions. Weird, and all kinds of excellent weird topics tomorrow. Uh, check it out at mysterious.fm or just type in uh, Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World into your machine. That'll do it for us. Hey, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Stacy's going to be back, scientist and theologian, and we're going to do faith and science. We'll see you then, God willing, right here on Catholic Answers Live. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. I'm trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless you.